There is one continent in the world that is known for its abundance. It's our second largest continent and has a population close to 900 million people. It's Africa. Early hunters in the 1800s wrote of the abundance of wild game roaming the country. There's game here as far as the eye can see. Then they tried to trophy most of it. The world's longest, largest and most spectacular herd migrations occur here and it's a country as wild as any on earth. Laying claim as the continent longest inhabited by human beings, this is the birthplace not only of us, but also of a myriad of wonderful species. The most southwesterly point is at the tip of the Cape Peninsula in South Africa. This stunning region is located 60 kilometres southwest of Cape Town. Its wild beauty matches its rugged terrain with rocky sheer cliffs that disappear into the ocean. This outcrop of the Table Mountain National Park is called Cape Point. This is the most southwesterly point of South Africa. However, there is some debate as to whether it's the Cape of Good Hope to my left or Cape Point to my right. Whatever, this is where our South African adventure begins. With cold winds straight from the Antarctic, this place can provide a bitter chill. But this tough place still provides a home or a stopover for approximately 1,100 indigenous plant species, dozens of birds, and a variety of other wonderful animals, including this curious baboon. These chakma baboons sit and stare in fascination at us while we sit and stare in fascination back at them. Or maybe I'm just flattering myself. Here on the peninsula, they're the only protected population of this species in Africa. We were told when baboons approach, hide food. They're usually on the hunt for the contents of your picnic basket. I also wanted to try and get close to these wonderful bontobok, who were casually feeding in the park. I didn't want to spook them, just get close enough to take some pics of the famous wild game of South Africa. This is my kind of hunting safari, as I shoot only a camera for my prize and no animal gets hurt. But that wasn't the case once. Bontobok were killed as pests and were reduced to a mere 17 individuals in the wild. But they've recovered now. I felt like we were rushing, but there's so much to see here. Our next visit was to the wonderful but endangered jackass penguins at Boulders Beach. The altogether elegant yet clumsy jackass penguin is found nowhere in the world except off the coast of southern Africa. And like so many wonderful animals, man has made a massive impact on their population. In the early 1900s, these cute little guys had an estimated population over one and a half million. But a combination of collecting their eggs modern commercial fishing and oil pollution has reduced the population to just over 100,000. While I snap the cute mamas and their chicks, I get curious about their breeding habits. They form pairs and breed on the 24 offshore islands between Namibia and Port Elizabeth. But being on mainland Africa, one does become wary of predators. This is why jackass penguins nest by burrowing in the sand under overhanging rocks, under bushes, or even in the open. Like us, they can breed at any time of the year and usually have one or two chicks that start all cute and fuzzy. While one parent gathers food, primarily fish like sardines and anchovies, not really my favorite, the other stands guard over the little ease. It's fun to watch the fisher penguins returning home and waddling up the beach back to their waiting partners who are yelling, where's my dinner? As usual, I took the time out to make a few personal friends, like this curious little guy who wandered up to me. Back, Men always lose interest so quickly. I think it's time we made sure these little penguins were around for a long time yet. So if you want to help, educate yourself with conservation groups like SANCOB, the Southern African Foundation for the Conservation of Coastal Birds. Next on Roar of the Wild, join me as we go cliffing, otherwise known as abseiling, 
and head further up South Africa's garden route on the eastern coast to Durban. How's this? Ostriches. First I see baboons on the beach, now another sight that I've never seen. Ostriches on the beach. They just don't seem to go together. The scenery of South Africa's coastline is spectacular as we make our way from the Southwest Cape along the scenic garden route, along the Eastern Cape heading north to Durban and then onto the Shishlui Amphilosi Game Park. But first, there is one sport in South Africa that blends the beauty of nature, a little excitement and the thrill of a lifetime. It was time to go quizzing, or what we in Australia call abseiling, which anyway is German for rope down. We were at Kamikaze Canyon. Like, that name doesn't give you a hint of what's to come. Then, this intrepid reporter was strapped into a harness and I thought, good, another adventure activity notch for my belt. Looking out over the ocean was spectacular. Looking down was a reality check. We were high. How are you feeling? <laughs> Absolutely petrified. My heart's going 100 miles an hour. And they expect me to jump off this cliff here and go straight down. It's a couple of hundred metres to the bottom and I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just plunging. <laughs> it's incredible. I seem to have trekked and climbed up a lot of hills and mountains in this series. But this is the quickest and most nervous I've ever come back down. I just wish I'd remembered to look at the view. Your legs wobble, fighting your mind, saying, no, this is not what us humans do. Get on the ground quick. But I started to feel very confident in the people around me. I started this extreme activity as a steely-eyed professional. Then, with one practical joking swing, I was reduced to a squealing, girly mess. Oh dear, there's fun and lessons in everything. We were soon on the road again. Travelling along this coast showed me a contrast of worlds. And here was that contrast. The lushness of this garden route, and in the next town, the tragic tower of the Neisner elephants. The elephants of the Southern Cape were once an important part of the ecology of the area. This skeleton in Neisner is from one of the last Neisner elephants, known as the rainforest elephants. Fires, heavy poaching and uncontrolled logging have meant the noble herds of yesteryear have nearly died away. Today, only three elephants are known to be living wild in the area, and they have retreated deep into what forest is left, where they've hidden themselves from humans and our destructive ways. This thought lingered hard as we made our way up the coast. Our journey hit a cold front, and we had many miles to cover. Luckily, I was in good company and among friends. I kept expecting to see the open plains of animals that I read of when I was young, but that seemed to belong to another time. There was a distinct lack of roaming animals here. But there were some fascinating towns full of colour, wonderful smiles and sometimes signs of the struggle of life. The coastline along the way gave us some wonderful opportunities to get out, stretch and enjoy the magical sunrises and sunsets that South Africa is famous for. But the trip in between just left my heart a little sad. Like so many countries around the world, man has changed South Africa. The land of migrating beasts I could only dream about and the plains of plentiful herds confined to the boundaries of game parks. Eventually, we arrived in one of South Africa's main cities, Durban. It was dawn, and I thought I was the first one up. Surfers are always out at first light, and fishermen in their dozens cast their lines off the local jetty as the sun rises. Perhaps with so much competition, the early bird catches the fish. Today was a market day to gather supplies and take in some local culture. It seemed there was a little black magic in this town. I tried to chant myself, taught to me by a so-called expert. It was now time for our real mission, to meet the wonderful wildlife of South Africa. 
We still had to head north and slightly inland to get to the Shishlui Anthlozi National Park and the big game. We chose this park because of the success they had bringing the white rhino back from extinction. This was going to be tough, but exhilarating. I could just feel it. Coming next, at last, the big game I came so far to see. Rhinos, elephants, giraffe and heaps of other cool critters. Set in the heart of Zululand, Shishlui Anvilozi is the oldest game reserve in Africa. This is more like the old Africa. And this place was where Zulu kings such as Dingus Wayo and Shaka hunted. It's also where the first conservation laws were put into place when the park was established in 1895. This is a large and very scenic park with valleys and plains as far as the eye can see. Contrary to what you may believe, wild game is rarely seen roaming freely throughout South Africa. Hunting, poaching and farming throughout the last century has taken its toll. Animals like the white rhino have survived only due to the efforts of game parks like Shishlui Amphilozi. The park covers some 96,000 hectares and contains an immense diversity of life. It contains hundreds of endangered black rhino and the largest population of white rhino in the world. It's a conservation success story and I was going to see firsthand how this park brought the white rhino back from extinction. The, the management of the park come up with a figure of rhino that has to be removed from the park. What happens is there is, are too many rhino at the moment in the Amphilozi Park. So they have to remove a certain amount, it's almost like a culling operation if you can call it that. But we just remove the animals live. Uh, annually the research team will go with a fixed wing uh, aeroplane and they'll count the animals. And from that they'll determine the, how many animals there are in the park, look at the carrying capacity and then decide how many animals can be removed. What we do then is when the animal arrive here, we put them into these bigger enclosures or bigger bomas, just to get them used to feeding. It's quite a tricky process to get the animals from feeding because it's, it's an unnatural process, you know, from being out there in the wild to come suddenly being in, in a boma. So what we in the beginning do is give them green feed. We go and cut green grass in the bush to make it look natural. What we do is we feed them in these boxes to just get them used to this small in confinement. Uh, so the day when we move the animals, um, you know, it's not that stressful on them. Yeah, they're used to the box, especially on long trips, which might take two or three weeks. So a rhino like this, where will this rhino end up? The black rhino is a bit different to the white rhino. White rhino will sell individually to game farmers and maybe overseas clients. Um, when I mean overseas clients, zoos, safari parks, etc. The black rhino, we only sell to South African buyers with approved properties. And so approved properties, we'll get a scientist, will go out to those properties, assess them, vegetation, security, etc. And then we'll sell them as a group. But 90% of all the rhinos sold on the auction will go in South Africa, which is usually not longer than a five, six hour trip. Revenue is essential if game parks are to continue. Each year, an auction takes place at Shushui and Filozi. Millions of dollars change hands, and this contributes to ongoing management. But to really appreciate the wild game, you've got to get out amongst it, and that is what I have been dying to do. Naturally, I wanted to get on ground level and track the environment where the wild animals live. When walking in South Africa, it's always a good idea to go with a guide who knows the country. We may be in a park, but the boundaries are very big and the animals can roam wherever they want. I know we sometimes come across with some dangerous animals like uh, rhino, buffalo and the lion. So if you come across with the rhino, if the rhino charges you, you mustn't run away because the rhino is running faster than you. It runs about 45 k's per hour. So if you can run about 50 k's, you can run. You can do that. Oh, I hope I see a <laughs> Otherwise, you just find some big trees and you, you climb up the tree. So you climb up the, the tree or you hide behind the, the tree. Or hide or, behind you because you've got the gun. No, you mustn't hide behind me. Sometimes <laughs> I'm going to run away that way and then you mustn't follow me. 
So with instructions clear, don't hide behind the guide, we started off into the wilderness. I finally felt like this was the wild Africa I'd heard about. At any moment, we could find big game, and we were hot on their heels, as we were finding signs of them everywhere. You can see this is different. This is white rhinos from no grass, because he is a grazer. But this one, you see the little bit one, you see the reddish color, this black rhino. But uh, not so much stick. Some some of the black rhino you find more sticks. Yeah. Animals live here, and animals die. It's the law of nature. Our trek uncovered some very big bones. Giraffes seem like peaceful animals, and whenever we saw them on our trek, they seemed to be hanging in small groups or families. But these bones uncovered a more violent side. The guide believed this had been a fight to the death. And sadly, we had found the loser. A broken neck for a giraffe is a serious injury. And this one our guide estimates over 10 years of age. Our next discovery was a water pool. Water out here in the savannah is a precious commodity and animals are always drawn to water. But our next site would be the prize for me. We knew we'd been on the trail of a rhino, but when we actually came across them, the reality of the wilds of Africa suddenly hit me. I followed closely to the guide. My mission was to get close enough to take some nice photos in the wild with no fences. I was familiar with the fact white rhino have pretty poor eyesight, and our guide had brought us downwind so we could not be smelt. But rhinos do have pretty good hearing. Now this experience is something really special. After some great shots quite close to a rhino, I was buzzing. Our trek then took us to some muddy pools. After a good long soak in the mud, there's nothing like a scratching pole to reach the hard to get to spots. Ah, oh, a little bit lower. Lower. Ah, that's right, just there. Next on Roar of the Wild, I play hide and seek with the locals and meet my first hippopotamus. Sometimes if you want to catch animals in their natural habitat, you've got to be prepared to sit and wait. And the best place to do that is in one of these, a hide. Hides are usually strategically placed for good viewing action. And one way to ensure people will see the animals is to build a hide near those valuable drinking holes. So the best thing about these are that the animals get to roam free and we humans get to sit in the cage. That's fair enough, as this is their home and we are the visitors. Sure enough, the animals came. Among the regulars at this drinking hole were many species of antelope, including the kudu, who came down for their daily drink. A family of cheeky warthogs. Mum and Dad leaving and Junior having to run after them. Wait for me! A lazy tortoise sunbaking on a log. And a beautiful family of zebras who seem to synchronise their drinking. What a magical place to wait a while and a great place for photo opportunities. Of course, another great way to check things out is driving through the park. You can cover a lot of ground and get to see the wonderful herds of wild beasts. One of the animals that has large herds is the wildebeest. Also known as the gnu, spelt G-N-U, it's actually a large antelope. Dutch settlers named it wildebeest, which literally means wild beast. But these spirited creatures migrate more than 800 miles and the resulting tramping of the ground actually encourages grass growth. Down near the river, 
we ran into another couple of large African animals. On the opposite bank, the trees were rustling. Then suddenly a long nose stuck up in the air. The nose was unmistakable. We had stumbled on a small group of elephants happily feeding along the bank. We also found a strange group of individuals who were up to a little monkey business. And watching them reminded me of a few people that I know. We really are not too different from these guys. There was so much to see here at Shishlui Amphlozi. It is home to 1,600 white rhino and 370 black rhino, an impressive number which means you are very likely to see one or both species. It also contains the rest of the big five, buffalo, elephant, lion and leopard, as well as many other species including blue wildebeest, zebra, giraffe, waterbuck, nyala, kudu, bushbuck, warthog, cheetah, hyena and jackal, plus about 24,000 impala and in excess of 300 species of birds have been recorded. It may not be quite the flowing plains of yesteryear, but at least with wonderful parks like this, the wildlife has a place. My last stop on this journey was to the beautiful St Lucia Wetland Park, which was declared South Africa's first natural world heritage site on the 1st of December 1999. The park has 280 kilometres of near pristine coastline and comprises 328,000 hectares of magnificent scenery. It's also home to the largest population of hippopotamus, not to mention crocodiles, so there'll be no swimming here. My trip to Africa has shown me some wonderful sights. The more people going to see wildlife and urging the protection of wilderness areas, the more we can strive to keep the balances between us and nature. What a wonderful world we live in. Let's keep it that way forever.